إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله Indeed the most truthful of speech is the book of Allah وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and the best guidance is the guidance of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَشَرُّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا And the worst of affairs are those things we newly invent into this religion of ours. وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ And everything we newly invent into this religion of ours is an innovation. وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every innovation is misguidance and it leads astray. وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ Every going astray and every misguidance is in the hellfire. ثم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have stories amongst the Sahaba <coughs> that many of us know, the popular ones, about Ibn Mas'ud and Abu Huraira and Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. But there are some that we, although we have heard of, we constantly never mem mention or we constantly forget. The companion Julaybib radiallahu anhu was a companion who <clears throat> was given a name that means small grown. It was an indication that he was small and short, maybe even like a dwarf, like a midget in stature. He was described as damim, one who had an ugly appearance, repulsive, not good to look at. His lineage on top of that was not known. Who was his mother, who was his father. And in Arabia that was a huge thing. To know who you came from. We know he was from the Arab. And we know that he was from the Ansar. He had disabilities though. And he lived with them. And people ridiculed and made fun of him. Not like, could, like someone could withstand in this day and age. We always see the one who looks different who has deformities, who has difficulties, being mocked and ridiculed. Because of this, he constantly sought the company of women because he, the men would make fun of him and ridicule him. So he questioned, was there hope for me to be someone significant in this ummah? Was there any hope of finding satisfaction as an individual and to please Allah and make it to Jannah? Our Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he was the best at knowing the needs of his companions. So he knew Julaybib sought a wife. He knew Julaybib sought a wife. So Julaybib, upon this, agreeing to want to seek some spouse in marriage, the Prophet وسلم, he went to one of the houses of the Ansar and said, Zawujni ibnatak, marry your daughter to me. So the father, upon hearing this, is thrilled, thinking he wants the daughter of this Ansari man for himself. Upon seeing this, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Inni lastu uriduha li nafsi. He says to him, I do, want, I do not want your daughter to marry to myself. I want her for somebody else. When he questioned who the, then to who, he said, Le Julaybib. He said, I want to marry her to Julaybib. The father knew he was one who was ridiculed, one who was mocked, one who was not, you know, well known amongst the companions. 
He was so shocked, he said, let me ask her mother. So he, he went to the mother and told her, and the same story goes. She was excited when he said the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was here for our daughter's hand in marriage. She was thrilled, of course, until he said it was for Julaybib. She said, never. I will never let Julaybib marry our daughter. This is an absolute no. Go back and tell the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about this. So as the father was going back to tell this to the Prophet Wasallam, the daughter heard this request and came out and asked her parents what is going on. And they said, the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, has come to ask for your hand in marriage, but to Julaybib, but don't worry, we're saying no to him. The daughter, knowing that he was one who was ridiculed, not good in appearance, not popular amongst the people, not wealthy, not having a lineage. She could have easily said, oh, thank God. This is great news that you're, you know, you're turning this down and I don't have to, to yani, go through with it. Instead, her, her, her response was, أَتُرُدُّونَ عَلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَمْرَهُ أَدْفَعُونِي إِلَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَإِنَّهُ لَنْ يُضَيِّعَنِي he said, she said to her parents, do you refuse the request of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Send me to him so I can tell him that I accept and he would never bring ruin to me. Nothing Allah or his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prescribed for us or would do to us would bring us ruin. It would only bring us closer to his pleasure. So this was truly a great person who had clear understanding of what it was, what it takes to become a Muslim to be a Muslim. What greater satisfaction and fulfillment can a Muslim find in, than in responding willingly to the requests and the commands of the Messenger of Allah? No doubt this companion understood this verse and even mentioned it to her parents. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَقُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَانًا مُبِينًا she understood this ayah that many of us ignore or think that we can trump or supersede. Allah says what means it's not for a believer, man or woman. When Allah and His Messenger have decreed a matter that you should have any option in that decision and whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger, he has indeed strayed in plain error. It was said that this Ansari girl, she read this verse to her parents and said, I submit myself to whatever the Messenger of Allah وسلم, deems good for me. When the Prophet وسلم, heard this, he made the dua for her, Allahumma sub alayha al khayra sabba, wa la taj'al aishaha kadda. He said, O oh Allah, bestow good on her in abundance and make not her life one of toil and trouble. It was said amongst the Ansar that she was the most prized of the eligible brides there. And she was married by the Prophet ﷺ to Julaybib radiallahu anhu. And they lived together until he was killed. How was he killed? And what is the story behind that? They went on an expedition and the Prophet ﷺ <coughs> had an encounter with some of the mushrikeen, with the polytheists. And there was a battle. And when the battle was over, the Prophet ﷺ, his first concern always was to go and find those who we lost. He said, هَلْ تَفْقِدُونَ مِنْ أَحَدْ Has anybody lost anybody? Has anybody left? Has anybody not here that we know that it was from our group? So the companions went around looking. We lost so-and-so, we lost so-and-so. أَنْظُرُوا هَلْ تَفْقِدُونَ مِنْ أَحَدْ Keep looking. Have we found everybody that was with us? Have we lost anybody? Until everyone said, no, we have everyone present. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, he said, لَكِنَّنِي أَفْقِدُ جُلَيْبِيبَ He said, rather, I have not found Julaybib. So go and look for him. So the companions went until they found him. One man surrounded by seven mushrikeen, seven polytheists around him. He was killed, and the seven around him were killed. فَاطْلُبُوهُ فِي الْقَتْلَ is what he had said to go and find him. قَتَلَ سَبْعَةً وَقَتَلُوهُ هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ هَذَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْهُ He said, seven he had killed around him and they killed him. 
I am from him and he is from me. I am from him and he is from me. I am from him and he is from me. It was said that he had repeated it two or three times. The Prophet ﷺ then took him in his arms and dug the grave for him and placed him in the grave himself. And he was not washed because he was from the shuhada, from the martyrs. Radiallahu anhu wa arda. Julaybib and his wife, they're not from the companions we always talk about. They're not from the ones mentioned in many narrations. They're not from the ones that we always revere and admire. But we see how humble human beings in this ummah were given hope by Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Instead of despair and self-debasement, he gave them a chance to be someone high in the sight of Allah. The attitude of this unnamed Ansari woman. We don't know her name, but look at her response. How can you turn away what the Messenger of Allah wanted for me? He would not bring ruin to me. The attitude that she had, how she readily agreed to marry someone who was unattractive, someone who was mocked at, someone who was ridiculed, was an attitude that showed she understood what Islam came with. She understood the Book of Allah. She understood the Sunnah of His Messenger ﷺ. It reflected on her path of effacement of personal desires and preferences, even when she could have counted on the support of her parents. It reflected total disregard for social pressures, where nowadays we will go and change our face, our bodies, everything about us, just to socially fit in billah. It reflected above all the confidence she had, the trust she had in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the attitude of a true believer. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, what can we learn from this story? Number one, Allah does not care what you look like. He doesn't care how wealthy you are. Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَى صُورِكُمْ وَأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَى قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ رَوَهُ مُسْلِمْ Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, Verily Allah does not look at your face, at your features. You can be the most beautiful of beautiful. You can be the most handsome of men. You can come with the most keenness of look that everyone tried to emulate in terms of looks, in terms of beauty, and the likes of those matters. Allah does not look at your wealth. Go to your grave, the richest man on the face of this earth. For some reason, that's an attractive thing to do nowadays, where you have magazines that will print the top 20 richest men, top 20 richest women in the world. Who cares? It benefits you nothing in your next life. Verily, Allah does not look at your looks. He does not look at your wealth, but rather he's going to look at your heart. That piece of flesh that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ That piece of flesh in our body, the heart that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if it is sound, if it is based upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, if it lives a life trying to please its Lord, the rest of the body will be sound. But if it is corrupt, the rest of the body will be corrupt. Allah will look at the hearts and He will look at the deeds. What did you do of your actions? What did you sacrifice for Allah? What did you sacrifice for Islam? What did you do to promote it, to teach it to others, and for you to implement it yourself? So Allah does not care about your looks or your wealth, or your fame or your status, or how many millions of people on the earth honor you and speak highly of you. You can be the most detested of people, you can be the ugliest of people. You could be the poorest of people. You could be the one that the people laugh at and mock the most. Yet in the eyes of Allah, you can be special by being from the people of the Quran. We also learn from this story that you should marry for the deen, not for wealth, not for status, not for looks, not for lineage. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, تنكح المرأة لأربع لمالها ولحسبها وجمالها ولدينها فاظفر بذات الدين تربت يداك رواه بخاري 
Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he taught us that a woman is married for four things. And you can look at this vice versa as well. A person is married for four things. And this one it referred to the woman, so we'll translate it that way. Her wealth, her status of her family, her lineage, her beauty, and her religion. So marry the one who is religious. Marry the one who knows her Lord. Marry the one who fears Allah so that you will not be of the losers. And this hadith is in Bukhari. Constantly, the look is for, well, I want this individual to be five foot ten. I want them to be beautiful. I want them. We understand all those things may play a factor, but they should not play the factor. Marry for the deen so that you will be successful. So that you will have a wholesome life. One where the spouses, where the spouses act like they should. A cover, a protection, a second, a place of comfort for one another. Husband to wife, wife to husband. Not like we're seeing nowadays. The marriage is filled with abandonment of the other spouse and abandonment of the rights that the husband has over the wife that the wife has over the husband. We learn from this story to be humble. Have humility. Because what you do have, if you are good looking, if you are wealthy, if you have high status, if you're someone who has fame, if you're someone who is popular, if you're someone who the people all admire and love, whatever you have of that means nothing if you do not have taqwa. It means nothing with Allah if you do not fear Him and keep your duty to Him. It's all a, a scam that you're fooling yourself with. And it may lead you to be arrogant and thus prohibit you from entering Jannah. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, Inna Allah awha ilayya an tawada'u hatta la yabghi ahadun ala ahad wa la yafkhara ahadun ala ahad. Ruahu Abu Dawood wa sahahu al-Albani. In Sunnah Abu Dawood and Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, he authenticated the hadith where the Prophet وسلم, he said that Allah has revealed to me that you must be humble. A Muslim should never walk with his head up high his nose in the clouds, thinking he's above the people. You must be humble so that no one oppresses another and so that nobody boasts over another. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما نقصت صدقة من مال وما زاد الله رجلا بعفو إلا عزة وَمَا تَوَادَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ رواه الترمذين This hadith is also sahih. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Charity does not diminish wealth. And Allah does not increase a man in anything for his pardoning or forgiving others, but Allah will increase him in honor. You know sometimes when we're so rigid to forgive, we don't want to forget. We don't want to pardon. We don't want to make excuses for one another. You're giving up on Allah honoring you. Because by pardoning others, letting things slide, putting things in the past, by doing this, Allah will raise you in honor. And no one humbles himself for Allah, realizes that he is nothing without Allah making him something. No one humbles himself for Allah, but that Allah will raise him in status. Who does not want to be raised by Allah to a higher level of Jannah? Mention to the angels, Allah pleased with you just because you humbled yourself in this life. An Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, an al Nabihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aqal, La yadkhul al Jannah, man kana fi qalbihi mithqala dharratin min kibr. Qala rajulun, in al Rajul. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, whoever has an Adam's pride or arrogance, that's that thought that you think you're better than others or you look down on others as we're going to see. Whoever has that in their heart, an Adam's weight. An Adam, you can't even feel it in your hand. You can't see it with your naked eye. An Adam, a mustard seed, something that has no weight. If you have that much pride or arrogance, in who you are, how much money you have, in your looks, in your, your, your nationality, whatever it may be. 
you will not enter Jannah. A person amongst the hearers of this said, Verily, a person loves to dress in good clothes and loves to have nice shoes. So the Prophet ﷺ, he remarked, Verily, Allah, verily Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. Allah is graceful and loves grace. Pride, kibir, arrogance is to disdain the truth, to deny the truth. You look for every way out of it. Out of self-conceit because you think you're allowed to do that. You think you're better than others. And to have contempt for the people, to look down on the people. This is what kibir is. We learn so far from this story these points. Allah will honor the person who is humble, the person who has humility, and the person who rids their heart of arrogance and pride. May Allah make us from them. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وبعد. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, again we don't hear about the companion, the Sahabi Julaybib رضي الله عنه, nor his wife, the Ansari woman who we don't even know the name of رضي الله عنها. May Allah be pleased with her. But in their story is so many examples for us to live that life that Allah would be pleased with. So many, so many, so many points. We'll mention one more because of the time that Jum'ah limits us to. And it's very clear. And it's mainly seen in the response of that woman to the command of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though her parents didn't want it even though the society would make fun of her or mock her for it, even though she would also be shunned for accepting it. Follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah, even if you get a whisper that you think or that something is or that someone brings to your attention that something or someone else or some other matter might be better for you. Do not oppose Allah. Do not oppose His Messenger وسلم, and you will be the best of people. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, قَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الرَّسُولُ بِالْحَقِّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَآمِنُوا خَيْرًا لَكُمْ وَإِنْ تَكْفُرُوا فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Allah says what means, O mankind, verily there has come to you a messenger, Muhammad وسلم, with the truth from your Lord. So believe in him. It is better for you to believe in him and accept what he gave you. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ Whatever the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gives you, you take it. And whatever He prohibits you from, you stay away from it. But if you disbelieve, then certainly to Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth, and Allah is ever all knowing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what means, so ascribe not purity to yourselves. So many of us put ourselves on a pedestal, even when it just comes to deen, where we think automatically we're a better Muslim than so and so because he or she does A, B, C. We have gotten accustomed to that, looking down upon others and putting ourselves up higher. Allah said, do not ascribe taqwa to yourself. Do not ascribe purity to yourself. He, Allah, knows best who fears Him and keeps His duty to Him. This is knowledge Allah really has. Sometimes we even fool ourselves to think that we have taqwa and our actions, our thoughts, our words, they're void of it. They're empty. ثُمَّ قَالَ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ يُتْعِ اللَّهُ وَالرَّسُولُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءُ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Allah says what means and whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم then they will be in the company of those upon whom Allah bestows His grace from them the prophets, the siddiqoon, the siddiqeen, 
the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who were the first to believe like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, the shuhada, the martyrs, and the righteous ones, how excellent companions these are. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, always remember this story of this great man and this great woman from this ummah because in it are examples that if we just lived by these teachings in this story, the morals of this story, we would be on a path to earn Allah's pleasure and make it to Jannah. In the last couple of weeks, a couple of brothers have mentioned a point to me about <clears throat> an aspect that again goes back to following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because Allah commanded us to. And that's the keeping of a dog as a pet. Many of us try to play with it. Well, it's a guard dog. The guard dog is if you live in a country far away from neighbors, no police nearby, and the likes of these matters. Hunting, unless you're an avid hunter who takes the dog out to find its kill, no one's really hunting with a dog, right, you know, for the most part. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he narrated that the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever keeps a dog as a pet, which is neither a watchdog nor a hunting dog, نَقَسَ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ مِنْ عَمَنِهِ قِرَاطَانٍ the Prophet وسلم, he said, and this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, whoever keeps a pet dog that's not for hunting or as a watchdog because, again, you live far away from people and it's not safe and there's no alarms and there's no police and there's no neighbors, they will get a daily deduction of two qirat from their good deeds. This is like two large mountains. And Abu Talha, he narrates that the Prophet وسلم, he said, لا يدخل الملائكة بيتا فيه كلب ولا صورة. The Prophet وسلم, also said, and this hadith is also in Sahih al-Bukhari, that the angels do not enter the home in which a dog is in. They do not enter a house that has a dog or a picture in it. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is not a matter again of choice. We know they're a man's best friend. We know they're cool. We know they're cute, whatever else you want to define it as. But their saliva has najasa. So much so that if it licked you, or licked a bowl, or it licked your shirt, or your shoe, you have to wash it seven times, once with dirt, the rest with water. So this is for people who are on tahara, not something which is allowed. So if you have the dog as a pet, find it a good home. Of course, we're to be merciful to the animals. But we have rules. We have things that we were commanded to do and we should follow them in order that we be successful. Even if your kids want it. Even if your wife wants it. Even if your husband wants it. The rules come from Allah and His Messenger وسلم, not from our own thoughts or desires. Allahumma khfir lil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat إنك أنت سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله أكبر